Hey everyone, Stan here, and after 3,000 years, it's finally time for some more Pokemon goodness. This time we're taking a look at Pokemon X and Pokemon Y for the Nintendo 3DS. Despite releasing Pokemon Black and White 2 outside Japan in October 2012, the world got its first preview of Generation 6 only a few months later. And to say Pokemon fans were excited was an understatement. With an emphasis on a brand new 3D world, and being released worldwide for the first time in the series' history, Pokemon X and Y seemed to be exactly what fans had been clamoring for since the 3DS was first announced. And with a gorgeous new region to discover, a new form of evolution, and of course the brand new fairy type, when X and Y finally launched globally on October 12, 2013, the series seemed prime for a kind of gaming takeover it hadn't experienced since the late 90s. With solid reviews and a completely revamped style, these Genichi Masuda directed games would go on to sell more than 16 million copies, and surpass both Ruby and Sapphire and Black and White's numbers when all was said and done. But more importantly, by abandoning the new Pokemon-only philosophy of its most recent predecessor, X and Y catered to and unified both old and new players alike, and only served to strengthen the bonds between fans and communities across the world. However, despite taking big steps forward visually and socially with its sixth generation of software, both fans and journalists found the main campaign and characters somewhat lacking, especially in contrast to the DS era of games. When it comes to my personal experience with X and Y, I was among the millions of fans who couldn't wait to play them for myself, even going so far as to seek out spoilers as I sorted through pages of leaks in preparation for October. Luckily, being in college at the time, my schedule was sort of all over the place, and so on the morning of release, I drove down to my local Best Buy with my friends Brett and Kyle to get my hands on the revolutionary new releases. I bought one copy of X for myself, and I also grabbed a copy of Y for my younger brother, who'd been seduced by the impressive trailers and his own lingering nostalgia, and wanted to check out Pokemon for the first time since Diamond. In fact, while I waited in line with my friends, it was clear that these games were having a similar effect on people just like my brother, who were sold on the idea that this franchise they once loved was finally taking a much-needed plunge into the world of 3D. And once I got home, I played through my copy of X for what must have been 10 hours straight. And then the next day, I did it again. The games were fresh, fun, and most importantly for the first time since Ruby and Sapphire, I had others to play and trade secrets with. Actually, outside of Sun and Moon, which I streamed for years during their peak, X and Y are the games I've logged the most hours and playthroughs in. This doesn't mean they're the best, of course, but just the ones I routinely go back and play for one reason or another. It was in Kalos that I learned about deeper mechanics like EV training and breeding for competitive Pokémon, as well as where I made a conscious effort to complete the National Dex for the first time in order to get that coveted Shiny Charm. But despite all the personal enjoyment this generation has provided me and my friends over the years, I've never really looked at it with much of a critical eye. That is, until today. So did Game Freak manage to transition this wonderful series into the next dimension successfully? And is the storyline as bland and forgettable as people say? Well, grab your keystone and get prepared for mega entertainment as we inspect every axis of Pokemon X and Y. We begin our Generation 6 adventure with a formal introduction to Kalos' esteemed professor, Sycamore, who gives us the usual spiel about the world of Pokemon. He asks us for our name, gender, and for the first time ever, we're able to choose from three distinctive faces whose skin tones and features differ in appearance. Now, I wouldn't exactly call these varying avatars diverse by any means, but it is a step in the right direction, and it definitely allows for a slightly more personalized experience right out of the gate. And once we finalized our appearance, we're thrown right into things, with a cool intro that immediately lets players know that we've indeed come a long way from the two-dimensional days of Red and Blue. But before we can really explore our small town of Vanneville, we're quickly greeted by our mom, a professional Rhyhorn racer, as well as our neighbors Shauna and Serena or Callum, depending on which gender you chose. The two encourage us to head towards Aquacord Town to further discuss Professor Sycamore's plans, where we meet Trevor, a shy, studious boy, as well as Tierno, a jovial fellow who loves dancing and seems very adamant on giving our hero a nickname. But that's not all he gives us, as we soon get to choose our very own starter Pokémon exclusive to Kalos. Like any group of starters, Chespin, Fennekin, and Froakie all have their pros and cons. However, despite Froakie's line being my personal favorite, I opted to go with Chespin this time around, as I think this goofy grass type just doesn't get enough love. Also, I bought this hat in Tokyo five years ago, and it felt like a perfect time to break it out. Anyways, like Sharon and Bianca before them, Serena and Shauna select the remaining two starters. We then receive our Pokédex and take on Shauna and whichever Pokémon is weakest to our own in our first Kalos battle. After this, we say goodbye to our mom, head through the first few routes with our friends, and eventually take on Viola at the Santaloon City Gym. With a visually stunning arena that shows off the 3DS's increased capabilities and a camera around her neck, Viola and her team of bug types shouldn't make your skin crawl too much. 
And with the bug badge snugly in our case, we can finally journey towards the bright lights of Lumio City. Once we arrive in Lumios, Kalos's Parisian parallel, things start to slow down a bit as we meet in battle with Professor Sycamore, who tells us about his research on a new phenomenon known as Mega Evolution. He also gives us one of the three Kanto starters, as well as a specialized stone made for each specific creature. Afterwards, Cinna, the Professor's aide, introduces us to Lysander, a fashionable inventor obsessed with our friend group's potential as Pokemon trainers. And here I thought Colrus had some crazy anime hair. Now, if this all sounds like it's moving a mile a minute, well, that's because it is. Between the opening cutscenes right up until your meeting with Lysander, the game moves faster than a Sneasel with Quick Claw. But personally, I really enjoy the rapid pacing, and with France serving as Kalos' primary inspiration, the backdrop of your adventure is always steeped in natural and historical beauty. Unfortunately, it's at this point that the game starts to drag a bit, as you'll be forced to go on multiple side quests and meet multiple new characters, including Diantha, a famous actress, and Corinna, a future gym leader, before you'll eventually stumble upon Glittering Cave. Also, it's during this period that we have two particular interactions with Lysander and Shauna respectively that help better contextualize their desires and motivations. As usual, I'll expand on both of these moments and a few others like them later on in the video, but I felt like they warranted a mention here. Anyways, it's in Glittering Cave that we come face to face with Team Flare, a stylish group of miscreants who prize their own happiness above anyone else's. And after we send them packing with some help from Serena or Callum, we're given a fossil for our trouble and finally able to take on Gran in Salage City. He's got a really fun rock type gym to traverse, as well as an appropriately named cliff badge to win. And once the dust is settled, we're able to make our way north towards Geosenge Town, where we run into the same Team Flare members from Glittering Cave. There's only a handful of grunts to face in the Town of Stones, and though they mention something about a 3,000 year old legend, for now our focus is on Corinna, who challenges us to a Lucario centric battle before telling us to meet her in Shalor City. However, before we can meet again, we'll have to make it through Reflection Cave, which despite being kind of a 3D ripoff of Gen 5's Charge Stone Cave, is still so visually arresting that I can't help but stop and explore every nook and cranny no matter how many Mr. Mimes I have to encounter. But once we've reached the end of this impressive cavern, Tierno gives us an intriguing stone as we make our way towards the Tower of Mastery, where we meet up with Corinna as well as her grandfather, a man simply known as the Mega Evolution Guru. He explains to us that in Kalos, there's a form of temporary evolution that allows certain species of Pokemon to become stronger. However, in order to unleash this mysterious power, we must pair a special device known as a Mega Ring with certain Mega Stones found throughout Kalos, and unfortunately for Serena and our hero, Corinna's grandpa only has one ring left to offer the group. Naturally, this leads to a heated battle between the two rivals, and with Serena defeated, we can officially take on Corinna's fighting type team at her gym down the street. But in a surprise turn of events, once we've received the Rumble Badge, the festivities are cut short as the rambunctious Rollerblader tells us we need to have one more battle at the top of the tower. And once we've ascended the summit, Corinna's Lucario decides to team up with us for one last match, as we finally get a taste of what this new transformation can do. Once she's been defeated for like the third time, we can bring our newfound powers to Kumarine City against Ramos and his grass type gym. And after doing our best Tarzan impression and claiming the plant badge from the geezer with the garden, we find ourselves dealing with another type of plant, where the diabolical Team Flare are once again up to no good. After tearing through one grunt after another, we're introduced to Team Flare's Aeliana, as well as another admin who... don't actually offer up much of a reason for being there. I mean, I guess their purpose was to gather energy to power some sort of device, but I'd be lying if I said that this explanation wasn't a little underwhelming considering how many battles it took to reach them. But regardless, once we've beaten them both, they take off with whatever energy they acquired. And as we make our way back towards Lumio City, we run into an enormous man who mumbles something about a flower Pokemon and eternal life. Despite this sudden shift in tone, the wandering stranger disappears before we have a chance to introduce ourselves, and after this strange encounter, the next step in our adventure is grabbing the Voltage Badge from Clement and his Electric-type Glass Cannons. With five badges now in our possession, and power flowing back through Lumios, we eventually find ourselves at a local cafe where the Professor and Lysander are discussing Mega Evolution. It turns out that this human Pantene commercial is descended from Kalos royalty, and as such, wishes to crack the potential of this new power source in the hopes of creating a better world for the region and its people. We also learn that it's his company, Lysander Labs, that created the Holocaster, a nifty digital device that can sort of be described as a camera phone on steroids. Soon after this discussion, we have a quick battle with Serena and hang out in a creepy cabin before arriving in Laver City, where the first fairy type gym leader in franchise history is waiting for us to confer the fairy badge. It's after this cheery battle that we're able to enter one of the coolest locations in the game as we discover Team Flare has seized the local Pokeball factory and have trapped the workers inside. The two ringleaders behind the heist, Briani and Salosia, never explain why the dastardly organization is robbing the place. But after escaping with a lifetime supply of Pokeballs, we can assume that they must need a lot of Pokemon for 
something. Regardless, shortly after we've saved the employees, we meet up with Professor Sycamore and his assistant Dexio, who reveal that Kalos' legendary Pokémon Xerneas or Evital, depending on which version you're playing, is slumbering somewhere sacred, and that they may have deep ties to Mega Evolution. But before we can dwell on this new information, we discover Team Flare harassing an Abomas Snow, in hopes that provoking it will awaken its full potential and maximize its energy. Though we're still not entirely sure on specifics, the leader of these bullies, a Team Flare scientist named Mabel, explains that the group are stockpiling resources such as money, energy, and even Pokémon in order to ensure they're prepared for some sort of upcoming calamity. But with Mabel's defeat, the team runs off once more, and after riding a Mamoswine through a snowstorm, we're able to challenge Olympia in Anastar City for the Psychic Badge. And once her mind-bending gym is completed, the plot immediately shifts into overdrive, as Lysander sends a dire message to every trainer in Kalos that Team Flare will soon be unleashing an ultimate weapon that will wipe out everything and everyone in order to make the world beautiful once again. It turns out that the dastardly group of rogues was less of an evil organization and more of a group of elitist doomsdayers who wished to remake the world in their more glamorous image. And so it's back to Lumio City once again where Lysander and his aristocratic cronies are scheming in their underground lab. He laments that he originally wished to change the future through his innovations, but soon came to realize that humanity was beyond repair and destined to destroy the world he loved so much with their greed and selfishness. And after a few battles, including one with Mabel, we see that he's imprisoned the strange giant from earlier, who recounts an ancient tale in which 3,000 years ago, a king lost his partner Pokémon in a great war. Wishing to resurrect it, he built an ultimate weapon capable of restoring its life. However, in his grief, he used the device to end the war in an instant. Knowing that it was the cause of so much destruction, the cherished Pokémon fled from the king, who was left immortal and alone to suffer for his crimes. Now, although this cutscene oozes style and does a lot in giving backstory to the ultimate weapon, I will say it creates an issue in that it's so compelling that it takes a lot away from the current goings-on of Team Flare. Up until this point, Lysander is clearly the main antagonist of our adventure, but now with the proper introduction of AZ and his heartbreaking story, I find everything about this character far more interesting, and I can't help but wish he'd had a larger role in the narrative, which kind of makes it difficult to focus on the current issues at hand. But regardless, Lysander's plan still requires thwarting, as we learn that AZ not only shares the same name as the king from 3,000 years ago, but that he also has the key to the ultimate weapon around his neck. Unfortunately, one of Flare's scientists named Zerozik tricks us into reactivating the weapon in Geosenge Town, where Lysander is waiting for us in yet another secret headquarters. It's here he reveals that the ultimate weapon is in fact powered by Kalos' legendary Pokémon, and that with its awakened strength, he will rob the Earth of all of its natural resources, including Pokémon. He laments that due to their potential, humans will inevitably use them as tools to destroy the world, and so they must be destroyed as a preventative measure. He then challenges us to a battle, and afterwards our rival suggests we can still stop the legendary Pokémon if we hurry before all of its energy is drained. And once we've reached the deepest parts of the underground lab with an assist from Shauna, we fully awaken the Life or Destruction legendary, which the game makes sure is captured by the player without much trouble. Seriously, the catch rates on these things is insane due to them being necessary for the plot. So if you've ever wanted to catch a legendary with a Pokéball, now's probably your best shot. Alas, without Xerneas or Eveltal powering the ultimate weapon, an unhinged Lysander storms our group, demanding yet another battle in order to reclaim its powers and fulfill his destiny as Kalos' savior. He's got some crazy new Dr. Octopus arms, as well as the ability to use Mega Evolution. But with a full-blown legendary on our team, this flock of seagulls wannabe goes down harder than Tierno doing the worm. Believing its powers will grant him eternal life like AZ before him, Lysander uses what little energy the device has stored in an act of reckless abandonment that ends up backfiring and destroying the weapon itself, implying that he faced the blast head-on while everyone rushed to safety. And with the ultimate weapon destroyed and Team Flare unceremoniously disbanded, we can now head back towards Anastar City to continue our journey, but not before AZ shows up mourning the loss of a certain Pokémon who abandoned him. From here on out, things go pretty much as expected from the tail end of a Pokémon campaign. We do take on Professor Sycamore, who apologizes for Lysander's unchecked ambition, as well as meet up with our friends on a bridge where we battle everyone except our main rival. But once that's out of the way, we challenge the Ice-type leader Wolfric at his Snowbell City Gym for the Iceberg Badge. And with our stylish case now filled to the brim with metallic hardware, we can make our way through Victory Road towards the Kalos Pokémon League. As is tradition, Victory Road provides us with many battles against the strongest trainers, as well as a final fight with Serena or Callum, at least as far as the main story is concerned. And once we've reached the League itself, things proceed very similarly to how they worked in Generation 5, with the protagonist able to take on the Elite Four in any order they choose. 
Though I do want to point out how badass these chamber introductions are. Just look at this. This time around, members include the Blade of Steel Wilkstrom, Drasna, a dragon-type guru with ties to the Sinnoh region, Sibold, an artist with a water-based team and his head in the clouds, and finally the fire-type wielder Malva, who's a member of Team Flare. Or, I guess, reformed member now? Regardless, this incarnation of the Elite Four are always a blast to battle. And once you've overcome each member, the gates to the Champion's Chambers open, where it's revealed that the strongest trainer in all of Kalos is Diantha who has an incredibly varied team as well as a Mega Gardevoir to crush. And after we've taken her throne, she's overcome with emotions as she registers our glorious team into the Kalos Hall of Fame. But whereas typically this would mark the end of our journey, X and Y have one more piece of story left to tell, as we actually get to attend a coronation of sorts where our hero and their friends receive medals for stopping Lysander in a scene that seems just a little familiar. <laughs> Either way, as the festivities are slowing down, AZ shows up in Lumios, demanding we battle him. For some reason, us taking him down seems to be the cure for his suffering, and now that he's able to put his past behind him, he's greeted by an old friend. And aside from a new meme being born, this royal reunion marks the end of our main adventure in the Kalos region, and though it's a perfectly fine self-contained campaign, it's admittedly a bit of a mixed bag. It was of course always going to be hard living up to the incredibly high bar of storytelling that Generation 5 expertly weaved over the course of its multi-game narrative. But honestly, X and Y don't even come close. In fact, in terms of the overall story, I'd say it's probably the weakest in the franchise since Generation 2. But unlike Johto, it doesn't even do a great job of building a lore to flesh out the rest of the region and its Pokémon. Also, the pacing in this one is all over the place, as sometimes you'll go multiple routes without anything that furthers our understanding of interesting concepts like Mega Evolution, or assists in further developing the wide array of characters who pop in and out of the plot, only to then get bombarded with over-the-top dialogue and bits of crucial backstory wedged in between two gyms. Like, I love the little storybook cutscene we get involving the war, and I think the themes and characters all have the potential to be great here. It's just that the games never give them the right amount of time to breathe or grow. Had they put more of an emphasis on AZ, or primarily focused on Lysander and his struggles with being a delusional prophet, maybe delving into his past a bit more, I think this could have been riveting stuff. Heck, Infinity War basically gave Thanos the exact same destruction for the greater good character beats, and say whatever you want about that movie, but they nailed the broken god complex he struggled with using way less screen time than a full-blown single RPG can provide. What did it cost? Everything. I mean, I don't want to get too heavy-handed here, but it's no secret that our planet is finite, and our resources are eventually going to run out if humanity keeps straining them. So it makes sense that there'd be a guy in the Pokémon universe who feels anxious about these problems and wants to correct them before it's too late. That's cool, and it feels like a natural progression of the more real-world parallels we saw in Gen 5 with its narrative regarding Pokémon enslavement and asking if that's justified. However, the difference between the two is night and day, as Black and White got close to the finish line and then wrapped it up with an all-too-neat bow because it's a kid's game, which I ultimately criticized them for in that review. But here, at least story-wise, it feels like X and Y never really make it more than a couple meters at a time without falling flat on their face. In these installments, it's clear from the get-go that both the messaging and the possible world-ending crisis seem to take a backseat to the colorful fun of a brand new Pokémon adventure, and that's totally acceptable for a franchise aimed at all age groups. Actually, in some regards, I can appreciate this philosophy. It certainly makes these games feel so much lighter than something as thought-provoking as Black and White. They're softer campaigns as a result of shifting focus towards action and adventure instead of plot and conflict, and I have a lot of fun crafting the perfect team and experimenting with battle strategies and the new mechanics. But replaying these titles in 2020, after seeing where the franchise is headed, it's hard not to feel like these empty encounters with Team Flare and lack of organic plot developments were a warning that we've now entered a time in Pokémon where the way certain events unfold with little to no substance is likely a byproduct of a time crunch. And whether it's due to an exhaustive schedule, unfamiliarity with new hardware, or a conscious effort to get away from the more weighty ideas of Gen 5 in the hopes of better sales, it's a little disappointing that basic elements such as the story, as well as a few other areas I'll be talking about later on, got caught in the crossfire. But as I said, despite a weaker storyline, Pokémon X and Y do have loads of new and exciting features that Game Freak ought to be proud of. So why not cleanse our palate at a nice cafe as we journey deeper into all the things that make Kalos a great time?
If I had to choose one consistent theme present throughout Generation 6, I think it'd have to be potential. Not only is this appropriate from a meta perspective, as ushering this beloved series into the third dimension required the developers to reach a little outside their comfort zones, but also the concept of potential is baked right into X and Y's DNA. For starters, the kids picked to go on Professor Sycamore's quest were all chosen for their unique and individual potential. Our rival is chosen for their parents' battling pedigree, we're asked because of our mom's reputation as a top-notch Rhyhorn racer, and Tierno's obviously picked for his sweet, sweet dance moves. Okay, that last one may be a bit of a stretch, but it's made quite apparent throughout our journey that both the Professor as well as Lysander see something special among these five aspiring trainers. And it's this belief in our friend group that makes them confident that we can assist them in unlocking the mysteries of Mega Evolution. Which is a perfect transition into our next example of potential, as let's be real, Mega Evolution is not only the shiniest and most marketable new mechanic in these games, but also the perfect representation of this theme overall. In fact, it's so obvious that at one point, Corinna talks about it as a way to push our Pokémon's potential as high as the sky. Now, I'll be honest, when I first saw Mega Evolution during the previews for the Genesec movie, I was not a fan to put it lightly. I'm not sure if this initial negativity was because I didn't like the concept in principle, or if it was because I didn't like that it was Mewtwo specifically receiving this special new transformation. I mean, I like Mewtwo as much as the next person, but this felt like a blatant form of pandering to older players, and I was worried that giving further evolutions to popular Pokémon was a clear indicator that Game Freak could run out of ideas. Of course, this was a pretty ridiculous reaction given it was just one example, and as more promo material for X and Y rolled out over the next few months, I started to embrace the idea a bit more, even if it did seem that Kanto Pokémon were still given a disproportionate amount of the spotlight. But now that I've had years with these games and played through them multiple times, I can admit that my early suspicions were dead wrong, and Mega Evolution is probably my favorite gimmick introduced in the 3D era so far. Along with fairy types, it was a necessary way to rebalance the games and ensure that certain older Pokémon who'd been outclassed due to time were able to become relevant again. And along with the presentation, it's the thing I remember most about Generation 6. Most of these Megas are pretty good, but even ones that might be considered a bit lackluster were sure to have powers and abilities that made them memorable in some way or another. For example, I don't think of Mega Kangaskhan as a stroke of creative genius or anything, at least in terms of design, but man oh man do I remember how ridiculous this thing was in online battles back in the day thanks to its parental bond ability. And then there's cases like Mega Garchomp or Gengar where I swear they only got upgrades to give them shinies worth talking about. And although it's admittedly a little bit lame that Pokémon like Charizard and Mewtwo ended up getting two forms each, yeah sorry Venusaur and Blastoise fans, but we gotta sell toys here. I was glad to see Pokémon like Pinsir and Medicham getting as much love as fan favorites like Absol and Lucario. Are there still too many Gen 1 Pokémon? Sure. And do I wish that certain Pokémon like Dunsparce or Delibird were given new forms to make them, well, usable? Well, yeah. But with dozens of Mega Stones to find and so many interesting new Megas to experiment with, there's likely something here for everyone. Well, unless you're a fan of Gen 5. Moving on though, this next one is the most obvious, but the excitement around Pokémon finally upgrading its aesthetic and propelling the series into the third dimension cannot be undersold. This was a big step for the franchise, and as we've seen in the past, transitioning gameplay and visuals into 3D isn't always a guaranteed home run, especially with so many people watching. But overall, and though it probably took them one generation too long, Game Freak did a mostly bang-up job of transplanting the core elements of a Pokémon experience into 3D. There are a few frame rate issues here and there, mostly in regards to things like double battles and swarms, which does suck, especially considering the latter is an encounter method introduced in these games. But for the most part, this is the best the series has ever been, at least visually. Don't get me wrong, I love the sprites of older generations, and I personally hope that someday the series goes back to that style in some form or another. But these games needed to evolve. And given the amount of dynamic cutscenes, customization, and scale of the world, I think it was the right decision. It's still on a handheld, so nothing here is going to compete visually with the console RPGs released around this time, and like most 3DS games, the glasses-free 3D is a feature that you likely won't be using very often, but I genuinely think the models and modern art style look fantastic. Now it's true that some Pokémon, especially those from older gens, got washed out in the transition. And it also feels kind of weird going back to these games after journeying through Galar and Alola, as the character models are all so... stubby. But for the most part, X and Y are bursting with color and creativity at every turn, and I feel like Kalos stands out as a region because of it. It's the little things like the moving camera during battles, dynamic text boxes when characters speak, or the energetic backgrounds that accompany the game's biggest fights that help my mind better incorporate itself into this world and forge bonds with its inhabitants. 
For example, there's this particular scene with Shauna on the balcony of Parfume Palace while fireworks explode in the distance, where she discusses the importance of making memories. It's a quiet moment that has a slight romantic undertone, and really helps to humanize this otherwise boisterous character. It's one of the most memorable parts in X and Y, and as much as I love the previous gens for their creative art direction and expressive characters, something like this experience just wouldn't have the same dramatic effect without the added immersion provided by the new visual aesthetic. And speaking of immersion, another major reason why I'm able to ground myself in Kalos so quickly is because of its customization. I already discussed the variety of avatars you can choose in the game's opening, but throughout your journey you'll come across various boutiques that will allow you to style your character to your heart's content and make them a better reflection of the trainer that you want to be. It's not as robust as other RPGs, including future Pokemon titles, but it was a fun way to define your character and added a slight tinge of replayability with each new protagonist having their own sense of flair as you unlock new outfits throughout Kalos. And overall, it's this sort of customization, better visual storytelling, and cool new mechanics like Mega Evolution that make Kalos a really great region to revisit. Though I honestly believe that Lumio City is way too big for its own good, I have to concede that having it act as a hub that becomes more accessible as you progress is something I enjoy. Some people may not like this, as it may feel to them like arbitrary roadblocks for the sake of padding, and they're probably right to some degree. But I don't know, I just think the region is diverse and simplistic in a way that makes it fun to explore time and time again. The gym placement and pacing could use some tweaking, but the variety of new creatures and routes with rideable Pokemon help to keep things fresh. And interesting locations such as the Pokeball Factory and the Pokemon Village keep me excited to explore more of this world. Although, I do wish it had more settings to explore post-campaign, but that's something we'll tackle a little later on. Anyways, I guess at this point I should discuss a few of the smaller but still important improvements that X and Y introduced into the series, even if the list isn't as long as it may have been in past installments. After so many years, having a typing that can finally stand up against the OP Dragon class was honestly overdue. And retroactively providing older Pokémon with this typing was a good way of making sure players had more options than just new species for their teams. Along with this positive change to matchups, we also got fun new additions like the Pokémon Ami and Super Training minigames that enabled players to spend time doting on their virtual pets or making sure their EVs are fully maxed out, respectively. These features aren't necessary to complete the game, but they're neat ways to get more out of the experience, and Ami certainly made it easier to get footage for this review. And it's among these bottom screen elements that we have one of X and Y's greatest contributions to connectivity in the player search system. This form of wireless communication lets you trade, battle, and assist other players with everything from hatching to stat boost utilizing the new O-Power feature, and is so easy to use that even today, many fans still wonder why it hasn't made a proper return. But along with this social platform, we also got controversial changes to one of the series' oldest mechanics with the adjustment of how the experience system works. Unlike past games, catching a Pokemon awards you the experience previously only obtainable through battling, which, in my opinion, is a great way to encourage Pokedex completion. However, the controversy stems from the changes made to the experience share item. As I'm sure most of you are aware, this item has always been a great tool in how it enables weaker Pokemon in the party to get a percentage of the experience points earned from battles that they're not strong enough to participate in. But starting in Generation 6, the experience share is now a key item that, when turned on, distributes experience and EVs to all non-fainted members in your party. This of course has led to experienced players claiming that this item makes the games far too easy and eliminates some of the challenge of raising a strong and balanced team. However, the reason I'm including it in the pro section is because I actually like this change, as it eliminates the need for heavy grinding and lets your adventure roll out smoother than Whitney's Miltank. And because, unlike some games we'll discuss later on in this series, it can be turned off if you still prefer the old way of gaining experience. And I guess before we get into the Pokémon themselves, the last thing worth mentioning here is the music, but at this point you should all know that due to being overly familiar with every generation, I almost always end up just praising whatever Game Freak's composers throw at us. There's a sense of adventure and scope in the music that does a wonderful job of encapsulating the emotions found within the region, and I personally adore songs like Route 15, Sycamore's theme, as well as like every battle theme found within the game. Sure, that's a super broad example, but everything from the gym leader battles to Diantha's theme and even the default wild Pokemon music just get me hyped to take on whatever challenge I might be facing at the time. The soundtrack feels more complex and interactive than any generation before it, with intros that catch you off guard and sounds that swell into emotional climaxes that once again help to further bond you to the places you visit and the people you meet. I still don't think that any overall soundtrack can ever overcome Generation 1 and 2's iconic melodies that are ingrained into my brain with the weight of a thousand Groudons, but X and Y's OST is an outstanding listen, and it's probably my favorite of the 3DS era of games. And now, onto everyone's favorite part of the review as I discuss the brand new Pokémon added to the series. 
At this point, there are well over 700 of these powerful pocket partners, and that's without mentioning the new mega forms, which obviously required their own amount of time and passion to produce. So where do X and Y's lineup of fresh faces rank among the series best? Well, it's a short list, in fact, the smallest new roster ever introduced. But despite the low quantity, the quality is actually ridiculous. Like, please, feel free to debate me in the comments below, but I honestly believe that this batch of Pokemon is near perfection. Between the brilliant designs and some of the most creative typing combinations we've seen from the series yet, there's so many winners here. Want a half-fighting, half-flying bird of prey based on a luchador? Done. Ever think about using a dark psychic vampire squid that can only be found by turning your system upside down? You got it. How about a ghostly grass type based on Japanese myth that happens to take on an entirely different design philosophy once it turns shiny? Yeah, that's here too. I mean, from start to finish, this roster does something unique or interesting with practically every new addition. From the starters who get arguably the most creative typing combinations since the series inception, the regional bird is one of the most viable competitive options in the game, the early bug type has an evolution with over 20 different patterns that change based on location, and the box art legendaries are powerful deities representing life and death itself. Sure, there are a few designs that don't quite reach these sorts of heights, but man oh man, the ones that really work are absolutely among the series' best, and if you don't want to take my word for it, go look at the recent worldwide poll conducted by Google, where Greninja was named the Pokémon of the Year for 2020. That's nearly seven years after its debut, and somehow this Water Dark type is still outranking Charizard and everything else as the series' best. So yeah, Gen 6 is limited, but also super high tier, and a few of my personal favorite designs include the starters, Talonflame, Vivian, Pangoro, Esper, the entire Aegislash line, Malamar, Helioptile, and Heliolisk, both fossils, Sylveon, which is probably my second favorite evolution, Halicha, the Gumi line, Trevenant, Noivern, legendaries like Xerneas and Evital, and even mythicals like Hoopa and Volcanion. And I need to be clear that these aren't the good designs found in Gen 6, but rather these are just the Pokémon I love with many like Talonflame and Gudra cracking my personal top 10. And even though they're not among my favorites, I can't pretend that creatures like Dragalge and Cloudster don't have their fans too. Heck, even Pokémon that seem silly like Klefki and Furfru are so dedicated to being ridiculous that I can't help but give them credit. Now, when it comes to Mega Evolutions, I honestly think they're all solid in some way or another, like the Mega Kangaskhan example I used earlier. I guess if I had to pick my favorite, it would probably be Mega Charizard X, which I know, it's like adding rainbow sprinkles to the most plain vanilla ice cream on Earth, but I can't help it. So yeah, I like Megas, I love the visuals, and I adore the region, soundtrack, and obviously the Pokémon. But along with an unremarkable story, are there any other important areas where X and Y fall flat? Well, let's just say that you should probably make sure your rollerblades are nice and snug, because it's time to go for a ride. In the past, I've usually had nothing but praise for the various characters that make up a main series adventure. However, when it comes to X and Y, well, let's just say that this batch of new personalities doesn't reach their full potential. Sure, design-wise, some of these new faces stand out, with Lysander, Serena, and even Sycamore probably making up the three most recognizable characters from Gen 6. But I can't help but wonder if perhaps that has more to do with their depictions in the anime series as opposed to what we get here. For starters, these are the games that took the concept of friends as rivals and beat it so far into the ground, not even Quagsire's Earthquake could reach it. You have four pseudo-rivals, all with their own goals and desires, but aside from Callum or Serena, none of them are much of a challenge, and most of the time they come off as more annoying than spirited. In the past, I've consistently struggled to even remember Shauna and Trevor's names, given how little they really contribute to the overall narrative. And the only reason I remember Tierno at all is because he's so unbelievably goofy that he's sort of transcended into godhood. I suppose he and his dancing are like a Bidoof with HMs in that way. But the fact that one of my favorite scenes in the entire game involves Shauna, and I've still had trouble recalling her name, speaks to how bloated this friend group is. As I've said before, rivals don't have to be dickheads for me to like them, but I do appreciate when they're fleshed out and given time to have an arc, which is something that really only Callum or Serena gets here. And even then, it's kind of the most predictable transformation you could expect. They're called to adventure, they want to beat you, they lose a few times and keep reiterating that they want to get stronger and push their limits. They then recognize you as a truly remarkable trainer before realizing that the memories and bonds they share with their Pokémon is the truest form of strength. They then go off to obtain Mega Evolution and come back sporting a brand new Mega Absol, but I just wish that maybe the side characters took more of a backseat so that this particular rival could shine a little more. Maybe their arc could have involved breaking away from their parents' legacy and forging their own path. 
Perhaps they even could have been coerced into joining Team Flair after they begin to doubt their abilities when we get the Mega Ring instead of them. That could have been an interesting twist. But instead, they're kind of presented as May or Brendan with a little more attitude, and I don't know. At this point, I just expect more. But hey, at least this group has a little to offer, because outside of Corinna, the X and Y gym leaders are once again relegated to nothing more than virtual checkpoints. It's a shame too, because some of these gyms and puzzles are phenomenal, and yet characters like Ramos and Olympia are so utterly forgettable that when you finally do have all eight badges, you'll swear you must have missed someone along the way. I guess Wolfric has slightly more to do with the Pokemon Village stuff, but even then it's nowhere near the impact of the clays and crasher wakes of previous generations. And even after Team Flare threatens the world, not a single gym leader shows up to help take them down. Now, that might be an unfair expectation because it would be boring if every game had a climax exactly like Black and White's, so repeating that sort of endgame showdown every time just doesn't make sense. But making the gym leader so underwritten and unimportant to the plot feels like a major step back for a series that was getting better at developing its characters with each new installment. And unfortunately, the Elite Four and Diantha aren't much better. Sure, there's two moments within the game where you get a better sense of who Diantha is and what she thinks of beauty and the bonds she shares with her Pokemon, but surprisingly for someone who's world-renowned for their acting abilities, we don't actually see her take any action at all throughout the entire campaign. Sure, through her words, we get a sense that she's a kind woman with a strong sense of self, but unlike every champion that's come before her, she rarely, if ever, interacts with the region in any meaningful way. It's always just a short conversation about herself, and then we show up at her chambers to finish the game. And might I just add, it's so weird that her iconic partner Pokemon is a creature from Gen 3 with a new coat of paint. Giving Diantha Gardevoir sort of feels wrong. Not only because it's not originally from this generation, but also because of everything that Wally went through with his own routes back in Gen 3. And I know he would eventually become more associated with Gallade, but I don't know. Even if Mega Gardevoir is technically its own thing, I just don't think it's fresh enough to stand out in a new or exciting enough way. And I 100% believe that Diantha is the worst champion, hands down, because of these reasons. Also, it's worth mentioning that in X and Y, the Elite Four and Champion don't change their teams at all if you rematch them in the postgame. Same teams, same strategies, and same levels across the board. Now, you can face off against stronger versions of these trainers at the Battle Chateau, which is kind of like a super grindy white tree hollow with all the puzzles removed. However, if you want to face off against these formidable League members or Diantha at their best, be prepared for a slog, and personally, I just don't feel like it's worth it in the end. But moving on to another disappointing cast of characters. I've already spoken at length about how poorly Team Flare and their cultish leader are incorporated into this plot, but it needs to be said that if they're not the worst evil team in the series thus far, they're definitely the most forgettable. They selfishly prioritize their version of happiness above the rest of the world, but to me the group's unwavering loyalty to whatever Lysander wants just comes off as unrealistic. The game does a poor job of explaining how such a selfish and uncaring figure like Lysander managed to convince all of these people to join a doomsday cult. It's like they wanted this to be similar to how Cyrus and Getsis controlled their respective factions, except we never get any unifying speech or any sign of Lysander using his charisma to sway people's hearts or minds in any meaningful way. In fact, aside from two scenes towards the end of the game, you never even see him with any members of Team Flare, and even that it only seems to be the scientist directly working on the ultimate weapon. I don't know, I'm probably thinking about this way too much, but I just think if you're going to give us a weird, sophisticated cult of blind followers, you've got to at least give them a little personality. And as for Team Flare's scientists, sure, they all possess distinctive names and designs, but they don't really do anything of note. Most of them sort of just disappear as the game continues, with the exception of Zerozik, who gets slightly more fleshed out in the postgame. And speaking of postgame, you might as well call it the Oras Battle Frontier, because it has disappeared completely. Okay, so there is Kailud City at least, which is a new area that you can visit once you've become the champion. And although it's worth checking out for a showdown with your main rival, as well as the Battle Maison and Friend Safaris, it's more of a centralized small town with a few cool things to do, instead of the postgame areas of yore that encourage discovery. Sure, the Battle Maison, which is Kalos' competitive equivalent to Unova's Battle Subway, is a nice treat for fans who like a challenge. But after the PWT, it feels like a major step down, and although the Friend Safari is an easy way to get various hidden ability and shiny Pokemon, I still can't help but feel like we got a little cheated here. The postgame has always been one of the absolute best parts of any Pokemon adventure, and whether it's been solving cryptic puzzles to catch a few legendaries, testing your might at robust battling facilities, or even being able to revisit an entirely different region, it's always been something I've looked forward to once I've gotten the campaign out of the way. But in Kalos, you just walk into a cave and boom, Mewtwo's just there. 
Same with Zygarde, the third member of the legendary Aura Trio who was done so dirty they had to give it a role in Sun and Moon three years later. And then there's the legendary birds. And I thought Entei was a pain. Upon completion of the game, you're able to encounter one of the legendary Cantonian flying types, depending on which starter you chose. It works very similarly to the beasts in Fire Red and Leaf Green's postgame, except for some bizarre reason, Game Freak decided it would make sense to encounter these creatures 10 times before you can battle it for real at the Sea Spirit's Den. Why 10 times? Who does this den belong to? Why are the birds so far from home in the first place? Well, I don't know, but let me tell you, it was an absolute chore to track the damn things down for this review. And to me at least, it once again feels like unnecessary padding in order to keep you playing. Which I guess brings us to the last piece of substantial post-game content worth addressing, which is the return of Looker. It's a perfectly serviceable side quest involving a well-meaning girl named Emma finding a home alongside the traveling detective, as well as a bookend to the saga of Team Flare. But personally, it's my least favorite content involving the international policeman, and for a good portion, it really feels like you're just going through the motions. There's no legendary Pokemon, no secret area to discover, no key item that will enhance your abilities. It's so underwhelming, in fact, that I sort of just forgot about it during the recording process of this playthrough, and had to unpack my cap card once I realized I'd missed it entirely. But moving on, while I would say there's a few other aspects of these games that I'm not as keen on, for example, the sheer amount of Kanto pandering, or how they ultimately feel unfinished, with the Power Plant and Zygarde being prime examples of the latter, I think the thing that hurts these games the most is something I've been constantly bringing up throughout this review, and that's the arbitrary sense of padding. I think it's absolutely at its worst when you're climbing down towards the legendary Pokemon, and what should be one of the most intense moments of the game feels so labored and repetitive. So many nameless members, one after another, even when you finally make it to the room housing Xerneas or Eveltal, there's still multiple battles to slog through before you can get to the good stuff. And it's this sort of content for the sake of content mentality that screams time crunch. Look, I understand that moving away from 2D and ensuring that this world would live up to the series' highest bars must have been daunting for Masuda and his team. But given all of the evidence, it seems extremely likely that in trying to make 3D work for the series, things became rushed and it was forced to take a few steps back in order to meet its global release window. And that's a shame, because X and Y as a whole kind of remind me of what Sycamore says about Lysander. How when, left to his own devices, he failed to live up to the potential seen in him by others and crumbled under the pressures he placed onto himself. And that just sucks, because this generation showed a ton of promise, but ultimately lost a part of itself along the way. As for bad Pokemon designs, well, there's none that I actively dislike, but I guess my least favorites are Swirlix, Carbink, and Bergmite, so take that for whatever you want. And with all of those negatives out of the way, I guess the only thing left to do is grab some macarons and hail a taxi as we steer into the final verdict. So, unfortunately, the sixth generation of Pokemon games are a bit of a mixed bag. But despite all of the negative things I've said about them, I still constantly find myself going back and giving them more love than something like Platinum. Not because they're better, but because they're lighter. They're easier. I know I've constantly brought up comparisons to the DS era over the course of this video, but in many ways using those masterpieces as goalposts doesn't really seem fair. Between Platinum, the Johto remakes, and all of Generation 5, those were created by a talented team of experts at the height of their creative powers in a medium that they understood perfectly. And although I think we'd all agree that a franchise should only continue to get better, I do understand why these games lost their way a bit, given the transition into the brand new style for the series. And with no definitive Z version ever releasing, this is all we're gonna get. Which is sort of a shame, but considering they sold more than 16 million copies, I guess things could have gone a lot worse. And so, taking all the pros and cons into consideration, I'm left awarding Pokemon X and Y a solid B. Minus. The visual presentation immerses players into the world like never before, and along with a gorgeous region, a reworked and exciting battling system, and more ways to communicate with local and online friends than ever, it's no wonder why many trainers, including myself, constantly return to Kalos. And with some of the best modern Pokemon designs in the series, as well as some terrific new takes on some old classics, these titles never feel stale, no matter what your team ends up looking like. But on the other hand, the characters and their motivations constantly fall flat or feel too familiar, the storyline and evil team are unremarkable at best and utterly confusing at worst, and the postgame is practically non-existent. Sprinkle in a bit too much Cantonian fanservice, a dash of framerate trouble, and a whole bunch of padding and plot threads that go nowhere, and you've got a bittersweet entree that was probably taken out of the oven too soon. But that's fine, because I guess in many ways I've always thought of X and Y as fast food Pokemon. They're bright, 
colorful, easily consumed, and overall they possess a sort of simplicity that ironically reminds me a lot of Generation 1. These are the sort of games that I recommend to those who are either just starting out, looking for a quick fix of pocket monster goodness, or maybe even those who want to take a crack at some of the more unusual styles of play, such as nuzlocks, shiny badge quests, or possibly even speedrunning. They're fun, they're simple, and even with all of the hiccups, they're sure to put you in a good mood if you decide to pick them up for the first or the 14th time. Just be prepared for the easiest Pokemon adventure of your life. So there you go, Pokemon X and Pokemon Y. And though they're definitely too easy, and though they're definitely lacking in content, I can't help but still love this generation, especially the Pokemon that came out of it. But what do you guys think? Was I too easy on this gen? Too harsh? As always, please let me know your opinions in the comment section below. And if you haven't done so already, please consider giving a like to this video as it helps the channel a lot. And I guess all that's left to do is pack our bags, grab our swim trunks, and head to Hoenn, as I finally review Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, two remakes I haven't really played through for real since they came out in 2014. And due to the world currently being on fire, I have a lot more free time on my hands, so expect my ORAS review sometime in the next three to four weeks. Yeah, that's right. Two videos in under a month. I'm back, guys. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring that bell because we're about to enter a new era of Random Tense content and you don't want to miss it. But anyway, thank you for watching this video. I hope you have a great summer. And as always, happy hunting, baby rhinos. Peace. As always, I want to thank my members for your continued support as I continue defining what this channel is. I promise that it hasn't gone unnoticed, and I'm hoping to regain your trust as I begin to re-energize this channel. I've been dormant for far too long, and for that I am sorry, and I'm willing to answer any questions you may have down below. You guys are the absolute best, and I couldn't do this without your help.